a group of people, volunteers, that have come together to do some activism work on climate change. Basically, some volunteers on a mission. Cl activism is where we believe in action that will bring about positive social and political change, systemic changes. So as a network of individuals, we try our best to communicate and address climate change. Um, all of us, as the name might suggest, Architects Climate Action Network. Uh, we're not just architects, we're any built environment professionals. So at this point, I really uh, must thank the volunteers who've put in so much effort into everything ACAN has done so far, as well as um, this event. Um, ACAN has achieved a lot over the last year or two, um, or especially the last year, we've gone global. Um, lots of countries now have ACAN grips. Um, we've looked at regulations, held real events, um, exhibitions, online events, um, gone to COP, um, was at Future Build, which is construction industry um, show, uh, social events, be, uh, as part of the social um, media in Instagram, as well as uh, working with, collaborating with other people um, and campaigning for things. So yeah, this is what we are, this is what we do. And thanks to everyone, we've managed to cover a lot of ground. And um, tonight, especially, I want to thank the back of house, Larry Tate, Eve Choi, Liz Brogdon and my co-host Rachel, Rachel Owen, who is the coordinator, the coordinator of this thematic group, Vincent McDonald, and all the note takers, Scott, Gina, um, Steph, and Victoria. And the rest of the climate literacy team as well. They've put in a lot of effort to organize a whole range of events that's coming up, which we will hear um, soon. Um, so you can join us. Um, I'm pretty sure Rachel will put a link to join us as well as uh, donate to us. Um, because without donations, we can't do what we do. Without donations, we won't be getting our speakers tonight. So it's also thanks to you for joining us and supporting us. Um, if you've already donated, thank you very much. And um, try and send the link to one person, just one person for some coffee change and that will make a huge difference. So, without further ado, we'll come to our launch event program. So what is it, what is it launching? Well, <laughs> um, it's launching two things, actually, because we're launching the Climate Literacy Thematic Group, um, to which Rachel Owen is our amazing trailblazing leader um, in coordinating us and um, is complete powerhouse and she will be um, talking to you later on about the thematic group and um, launching also a series of events uh, which Vincent will talk about later as well and let you know what will happen. So this is the rough layout of tonight just so you know and um, we will be actually trying to follow those timescales as closely as possible. Um, so, without further ado, I hand over to Rachel to talk about our thematic group. Rachel. Thanks so much, Glow. Um, and yeah, welcome everyone. Um, so yeah, as you probably know, ACAN has three aims. Decarbonise now, ecological regeneration and cultural transformation. And we work towards these aims within thematic groups. You can see those listed on the right hand side. Um, and they all do fantastic work with different campaigns, different events, lots of knowledge sharing, and um, they're all completely open. So you can join any one of those depending on what your interests are. In the climate literacy group, we're really focusing on the third aim of cultural transformation. So we're calling for a complete remodeling of our industry's culture. We must challenge and redefine the values at the heart of our professional and educational systems. Um, and we believe that the best way for our profession to tackle the climate and biodiversity crisis is through open knowledge sharing, learning from one another and working together as a collective. 
And we're aiming to support and enable one another to take our agency to drive the transformation to sustainable and regenerative practice. Can you go to the next slide, please? So at COP26, each of the thematic groups post, um, produced these posters talking about our vision for the future and how we were going to work towards it. Um, and what the Climate Literacy Group did was um, put together a climate glossary. And the idea is that we wanted to mainstream some of these critical terms such as biodiversity, um, and just transition, climate justice, retrofit and net zero, um, so that they would become a part of the everyday language that people within the built environment used. Um, but we also wanted to identify where practitioners needed support, skills and knowledge. And if you go to the next slide, please, you'll see that we then identified three steps to helping the industry transform. So first is promoting an increasing climate literacy within the built environment sector and beyond. The second is empowering practitioners to communicate the crisis we face. So engaging their clients, their colleagues and their collaborators. And the third is breaking down silos between practices and groups by creating partnerships, broad networks and lots of connections for more impactful knowledge sharing. And the more people that we engage and the more we work together, the faster and more effective this transformation that we need in the industry will be. So if this all sounds great to you, then you can join our group. I've put a link to our WhatsApp channel in the chat. Um, we'd love to have your energy and have you involved. Um, and now I'm going to hand over to Vince and he'll let you know how we're putting all of this into action. Hi everyone, uh, thanks Glo and Rachel. Um, so yeah, our first series of events is Practice Action, a collaboration between us at Architect Climate Action Network and Architects Declare uh, in partnership with the RIBA. The series aims to provide architecture professionals with the practical skills and confidence to pursue more sustainable and regenerative practice models. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? So it's split into five themed months. Uh, we've got 10 interactive and hopefully incredibly educational sessions for, for you all to get involved in. The AD masterclasses are going to be on Friday afternoons. They're paid for sessions which dive into the various themes from the AD practice guide. Uh, that If you've not downloaded it already, uh, it's on the AD website. Uh, go and grab it. It's an absolutely excellent resource. Uh, and they also count towards uh, CPD. The ACAN conversations are going to be informal midweek evening responses to the masterclasses but also standalone events, uh, and these are open to everyone. There'll be short introductions from a specialist panel and then lots of time for questions, discussions, debate, um, and so on. Uh, and should participants want to continue conversations after the events have stopped, we'll be providing spaces for that discussion and hopefully facilitating future connections and networks between us. Uh, could you go to the next slide, please? Uh, so uh, specifically, the AD masterclasses kick off next week. Uh, on the 6th of May uh, with a math class on climate literacy. Uh, the, you need to sign up for the single event on the Eventbrite link, uh, which we'll put in the chat as well, uh, or you can sign up for the whole series. Uh, yeah, please check it out. There are gonna be some fantastic speakers uh, and sessions uh, that they'll be running. And then ACAN's first conversation, will see us collaborating with the Future Architects Front to discuss the need to make space for everyone's voices as we transform to more regenerative forms of practice and to ensure a just transition. Uh, in these conversations, we'll aim to answer any questions that haven't been answered in the AD events. And you can ask us questions by either emailing, emailing us at climateliteracy at architectscan.org or by responding to our provocations and uh, on our Instagram account uh, at architectscan. Uh, so I'll pass back over to Glow. Great. Thank you so much, Rachel and Vince. Um, Without further ado, we'll actually come straight into our actual event of tonight. Um, and we will look at specifically how we communicate this climate change business to people because it is a difficult subject. Um, we as architects and engineers do this. We give graphs and say, oh no, it's terrible. And we're doing this, we're, we're damaging the environment and we give them lots of figures and pie charts and whatever and it's all doom and gloom and it is indeed because the disasters and extreme events that's happening around the world and then but then that's not very good just looking at disasters and targets not met um but 
if we look wider to how people communicate, um, I think you'll agree with me if you listen to Maya Angelou recite her own poems. It's about very tricky subjects, about emergency and crisis and horrible racism, whatever it is. But it carries so much hope, so much power in them um, that energizes you instead of put you in a doom and gloom space and make you want to walk along with them. And that is, as architects and engineers, what we need to do is to try and do that, try to bring everybody else along with us in the team we work with, at schools we teach, et cetera, et cetera. But how do we do that? And do we know how to do that? So this is why I suppose we're here tonight to look at exactly that, how we do it. So we have four amazing speakers that with us tonight um, from very different backgrounds. Um, and I'll go from bottom up so that when I get back to Esther, she'll be the first speaker for us tonight. Uh, Susan uh, is a writer, conceptual, conceptual illustrator, um, but she started off as a theater designer, so uh, a broad range of skills. And she's run a lot of workshops um, for schools and um, for eco groups, a sustainability um, direction, as well as looking at wildlife, and now um, writer in residence for Cumbria. Um, uh, and looking at lots of different things to connect people with, with nature. Hilary is an artist and filmmaker. She always takes the, the most um, urgent issues of the time and turn it into something that people can participate and take action about or, or think about in a different way. Merin um, is a poet, novelist, storyteller and playwright. Um, she runs amazing series of workshop called Storyland um, that brings together all these aspects um, and um, get people to engage uh, with, with body language or with, with um, readings and so on. Um, it's quite fantastic. And Esther is our first speaker tonight. She's an academic, an engineer, um, and collaborates globally, having uh, been born in um, Kenya, then studied in the UK, now work in the USA. Um, she has worked across the globe, literally, um, communicated to people who are from different backgrounds, from those in poverty, children, to medical doctors, to those in government and in power. And um, if we can welcome Esther to come and give us her um, start of a 10. <laughs> Right. Thank you. Thank you, Glo. Thank you, Rachel. And thank you, everyone, for having me here. I think from your introduction, the summary is I talk a lot. And probably that's true. That's why I'm a professor. But also, on a serious note, I feel blessed that I've had these opportunities to interact with various people and listen to them. And a lot of what I'll be sharing today is really just based on active listening. I will highlight a few stories to illustrate what is informing my thinking right now. One of my roles right now is uh, to direct an initiative that's called the Global Building Network. And that, that partly explains why I'm connected to various people in different parts of the world. Um, and as uh, when I started this job a few months before we went into the lockdown, I was uh, challenged. Why do we need a network? And that was, uh, for me, a, an interesting journey to go on. And uh, what I realized, the community that was in place originally, they were focusing on addressing climate change through promoting the use of energy efficient solutions. But then we, you know, when I started looking at the space, it got very fascinating because I realized that with all the investments that had been made, not just by our network, but by various organizations throughout the world, According to the International Energy Agency, the adoption rates are somewhere between 1% and 2%. And that for me was exciting. Like here is a real problem. We have so much knowledge. We have possible solutions. We are talking positive things. And yet people don't seem to be interested, quote unquote, in what we are doing. So the challenge for me at a personal level became, how do we make the information that exists and the information that we're creating relevant. How do we make it relatable? How do we make it timely? 
how do we make it actionable? My background had not prepared me to take up this challenge, which is a good thing because it meant now I had to start knocking on doors and asking people questions. Um, and sometimes I didn't even have to ask or to knock, or knock on doors. So um, a lot of my conversations actually end up happening with taxi drivers because I travel a lot. And uh, I will start with a conversation that happened in uh, August 2020. I was in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania with a friend of mine who works for the United Nations. And he asked the taxi driver, why are you guys refusing to wear masks? Why are you refusing to social distance? And the taxi driver said, you know, his answer was actually very eye-opening. He told us that our problem, our main problem right now is mosquitoes. And he was slapping himself. He said, this is the problem that we're dealing with right now. Malaria is killing our children, killing our family members, our wives, our parents. And, you know, for me, that was a fascinating thing. Again, I went and did a Google search and I realized that he was correct. At that particular time, number malaria was still the number one cause of human fatalities. So they were not saying they're not taking corona as they don't think it's not a problem, but they were saying we have other problems. And then for us as people who are in the built environment, we have not really made that connection between climate change and the fact that vector-borne diseases are now emerging in places where they never used to be before. Because the climate is changing, even places that had malaria the number of people who are being affected is increasing significantly. So the taxi driver, by clapping, his, slapping himself, reminded us, he challenged us and he reminded us that there's something that we can do as people who are designing, building and maintaining our houses, our offices, our, our, our schools. There's something that we can do differently to help them address a climate change problem that they have not called a climate change problem, but it is. And I'm happy to discuss Ackland because this is a subject that even prior to this job, we had looked at the connection between buildings and vector borne diseases, just highlighting some things. When we excavate, we create uh, the best maternity wards for mosquitoes. I learned this through these conversations with people who I interact with very regularly. And then on the flip side, I also realized by interacting with people who are in the medical and public health um, communities, um, contributing to the conversations and also li listening to them. In one meeting, somebody used the phrase or said a sentence to the effect that they, we are swimming upstream and we need to continue swimming upstream to address the problems and the issues that are causing illness or exacerbating symptoms. And again, I got very excited because I'm like, why would you want to swim upstream? Who's upstream? And then they started listing things. And one of them was housing. Housing is a social determinant of health. So I jumped right away and I'm like, don't swim upstream. Let us swim downstream to you. Yeah. And they were talking about things which are very relevant, very relatable, very timely, very actionable. In the middle of the extreme heat events that happened all over the world last summer, and they probably happen again, the doctors, the medical community, nurses, nurse practitioners, ETC, they are very concerned about the things that exacerbate asthma. I think somebody popped something in the chat, put something in the chat, in the chat. So as we approach them, we can actually tell them we are swimming downstream to help you address the exposure issues which are in the house. And you guys can tell us what are the diseases that we can link to things which are changing inside the house, whether it's humidity, whether it's um, extreme heat or extreme cold, or extreme cold, we can do this. That, was, that is an opportunity for us because as I said, it is much, much easier for us to engage with them at the level of the household than them swimming, the doctor swimming upstream. So that's a mutually beneficial symbiotic relationship that we've been building I've been building through uh, for the last three years. And I'm actually pleased to say to my pleasant surprise, a couple of weeks ago, I was given a courtesy appointment in the College of Medicine. I'm not sure what I'm gonna do with it just yet, but I'm gonna start by listening to the issues that they are dealing with and try to learn a new language, not to become a medical practitioner, but to become better equipped at understanding where the interface between exposure and disease allows us to start to make this connection with the climate change discourse that we're here to talk about today. The doctors are really good allies. 
Because if we can connect the evidence that we can generate at the housing level with the incidence of disease, they can write a prescription that will unlock health sector money to be used to fix the houses. In the Western country, sorry, excuse me, in the Western countries, there is that opportunity through healthcare, through health insurance companies. And we are hoping that as we continue to generate more evidence, we can start talking about climate change action in terms of doctors, nurses, working together with designers and architects to identify places where preventive health can happen. Um, Vector-borne diseases is something that I've talked about before. One of the things also, which is an area of need, I realized, again, conversations that I say happen in uncommon places. I went for a party and I was introduced to someone who works in global health. And when he heard that my background is building related, he walked up to me and told me, you know, hey, Esther, we need to talk. I'm also doing building related things. And I, was, I found out very, very fascinating. So I asked him, what are you doing? Again, because of climate change extremes, Malaria was popping up in new places and they went to try to understand how they can intervene to help people who are at risk minimize the occasions where they can be bitten by mosquitoes. So I found this very fascinating because this is a public health professional telling me that he's spending time in Ghana fixing houses. So I was like, what exactly are you doing? So he told me that he's blocking all these openings, that they've left these vents. And as I'm listening to him, you know, he's like, why are you looking worried? And I said, because this is a hot and humid context. And because of climate change, it's getting hotter. It's getting more humid. These people do not have air conditioning, do not block the vents. Yeah, so we realized immediately that we have a problem because the vents are allowing mosquitoes to come in. But then at the same time, we need the vents to ventilate the spaces. So that's an open-ended question. How do you optimize this challenge? I'm highlighting these examples because they illustrate a communication need that's being bridged through two people who are in very different professions, exchanging ideas and realizing that there are some problems that the other side of the equation is better at addressing, like in this case, blocking the, the openings. I told my friend, you know, people go to the School of Architecture for a very long time to learn where to place the openings. So you might want to have a conversation with them, but then translating it back to the person who's inside the house, the people who we are trying to improve their health and well being outcomes. When we are interacting with them at the level of health and well being, they will listen to us when we are interacting with them at the level of the school has indoor air temperature conditions that are making it difficult for your child to learn. They will listen to us. Final thing I'm gonna say, I've spent some time more than 10 years looking at the use of biomaterials. We've also preached that message as a community of how this is good for the environment, the polar bears and, and everything. But then the adoption rate is also not going as high as we want it to go. So linking this to things like extreme heat, everybody recognizes that it is getting warmer, it is getting hotter. A lot of the people in the communities where I work, the low income households, they cannot afford air conditioning. It's either not available or if it is available, they are already dealing with various social justice, energy justice related problems. They will not be able to turn it on. If we present the materials, as solutions to indoor air temperatures that are more livable, that enhance performance. Yeah, again, we have an opportunity to communicate the urgency of taking action to mitigate or adapt to the impacts of climate change without being negative. Um, you, Esther, that's, that's really amazing starter for 10 because you're going to explore all of those things with us in depth in your workshop later aren't you which, which is going to be fascinating i'm sure um thank you you've got so much experience and it's just amazing to to have you here tonight um but we have to um move on swiftly um got a very tight program um earlier if you joined late uh, uh, slightly late you have missed my call to bring a piece of paper with you um for um, this upcoming speaker, Marin. Marin is uh, born in Asia, grew up in Australia and lived in the Highlands in the Cairngorms now. Um, and uh, she's been a teacher, facilitator of different age groups and um, has now come to um, give us a 10 minute um, praise of uh, what her workshop might be entailing. Over to you. 
Thank you, Glow, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me to be a part of this evening. It's it's absolutely fascinating. Um, and, and my only disappointment is that I can't actually be in the other workshops, <laughs> um, but hopefully we'll be able to hear more about those at the end. Um, so you don't need to do anything with your piece of paper now. You'll, you might need that if you come along to the workshop later. I'm not an architect. I don't work in the built environment. So this is not a story about architecture. Um, but this is just an example of a, a way of telling a climate story that perhaps hopefully helps people to listen and to engage and to enter some level of personal connection with it. Um, I'm just going to tell the start of it right now, just for a couple of minutes, and those if you'd like to hear the rest of the story and explore ways in which you might be able to tell similar stories in your context, then uh, come along to the workshop. So this is the story about a boy from Bangladesh who's called Mustafa. For generations, his family had worked a stretch of land in the delta of the great Ganga and Brahmaputra rivers. This is their land. Their main crop was rice that they grew in the long rice paddies. For many years, they had adapted to the natural cycles of water rising and falling. Some months, there was more dry land and when the monsoons came, rainwater flooded the fields and the islands of dry land were smaller. But this happened every year and they knew the seasons and what they could grow at each time. And they were boat people, good at making canoes and plying them up and down their waterways. But gradually, things started to go very wrong. Okay, if you would like to hear the rest of the story and uh, join me in an origami session, then uh, come along to that workshop later. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Marin. That's a very powerful start to the story and leave us all on tender hooks. <laughs> um, I'm sure now everybody wants to flock to, to hear, hear the rest of the story. And for those who are actually not able to attend all the workshops at the same time, I feel really, really bad <laughs> because that's what, exactly what I want to do. I want to attend all the workshops. Um, so I'll go on to Hil um, Hilary, who's um, done some very interesting work with um, making films and gathering people to... to I think print money at some point um, <laughs> um, in Walthamstow where she's based um, and make really fantastic projects to engage the public. Ah, oh, Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, I'll share my screen. Hopefully this is going to work. Uh, can everyone see? Yep. View. Slideshow. So yeah. Well, as, as I've just been introduced, I'm an artist and filmmaker. My practice has always been working with layered histories and communities and the politics of specific spaces, mostly urban spaces and mostly London spaces. Um, most recently, this practice has grown kind of more public in its reach as I've collaborated with my kind of long-term partner in everything, Dan Edelstein. Um, We've set up a optimistic foundation, CIC, a community interest company that kind of emerged from doing a bank job, which was our last project. And this was this is this was our bank. And this was a heist that worked with our community in Walthamstow, northeast London, to understand and intervene in an unjust financial system. And it was a project that took kind of big concepts like what is money, what is debt. Um, how does the economy work? What is a creditocracy and are we living in one? And made them accessible and opened a discussion via kind of joyful, anarchic cultural production. And this really came through the framing of the storytelling because no one wants to talk about debt. Like if you try and start conversations about it, people really shy away from it, but people 
love a bank job. So it was really when we changed the kind of framing of the story in that context that that project came to life. And we took this kind of contagious leap of the imagination, taking over a former high street bank, making an alternative um, rebel bank, it came to be called, printing our own money that inverted kind of accepted value systems and celebrated those that were dealing with the fallout of an unjust economic model. So the people on the banknotes pictured on the front of the bank here were people running food banks, homeless kitchens, primary schools and youth projects, all suffering from austerity and cuts. And having that kind of public facing space, training and employing local people, printing money, made these opaque ideas become real and tactile and in turn malleable and open to question, which was the big thing. And that with this kind of sense of irreverent humor, we became Ho Street Central Bank, HS. So we always get it wrong, we're at HSCB when we weren't HSBC and invited people to participate. And production was also a film shoot and we ended up making a feature documentary film called Bank Job. And within the project, so after making all this money and exchanging it for sterling, we, um, used it to support those local organizations that featured on the banknotes and to buy up and destroy 1.2 million of local predatory debt. And that was done on spreadsheets, but also then most spectacularly in by blowing it up quite literally in front of the towers of finance and Canary Wharf in an action called Big Bang 2, which was named after the Big Bang of the 1980s and the deregulation of the financial markets. So that all happened in 2018. We um, exploded the debt in 2019. We, we had a kind of fight for the bank building in 2019, left it. The film came out in 21 and it continues to screen and, and kind of provoke these conversations and action in some cases around um, debt justice with um, working with Jubilee Debt Campaign and, and positive money and screenings around the country. But at this point, obviously, we were kind of emerging, screening that in the pandemic, and we were kind of locked down on in our terrace street and reflecting on what we'd learned and what we could do now to build on this and make change. So the view from the terraced rooftops of London, of this East London area towards the Towers of Finance featured a lot in Bank Job. And they played a role in our new plans as we kind of looked again, kind of turned, like everyone was kind of, looking again hyper locally and looking at our own habitat. The streets and streets of terraced houses, in this case, built in the late 1800s to house these new workers of the East London Lee Valley, all the re new relationships with our neighbors, the mutual aid networks that were springing up through the pandemic, kind of the clapping and the clanging of pots and pans to and whoops of firework displays at New Year. And this new sense of possibility within our very immediate community and through bank job we'd met Anne Pettifor who um, wrote the, and read her book The Case for the Green New Deal we kind of aligned that with Kate Raworth's ideas of donut economics and we've been working with um, Rapid Transition Alliance making films so it became clear that our kind of deep dive into the world of economic injustice and the kind of intertwined financial and climate crisis would be the thing that we would tackle in the next project. And one sentence stood out um, from Anne Pettifor's case for the Green New Deal, and that was every building a power station. So we decided that that, that was kind of what we were going to do. We'd, we'd be building a power station. <laughs> so that was what we decided, obviously, in, in the midst of lockdown. Obviously, that a plan kind of slowly emerged that we wanted to take our one street fully onto solar and other retrofit measures and to use it as a template and really a, a demand for this to happen on a national scale and to expand this to schools, other communities, um, rooftops in the area, and really ensure that this micro journey it would expose and tackle the key injustices of the current political, economic, bureaucratic, bureaucratic systems that are stopping this happening and to do that by the very media that we're using to share the project with film and artistic practice. And so just, it was really obvious by talking to people on the street that there was a thirst for this kind of action, not, you know, not maybe in some cases to directly to address climate, but in others more because of, you know, terrible housing conditions, cold and, and, and the, you know, particularly now the cost of living and the energy crisis, all of them intertwining with the need to just have heat <laughs> in the house and, and, and the inability to afford that. 
so talking to Dorothy, who was like had a hundredth birthday in November, and realizing that in her lifetime, you know, this amazing growth of the Walthamstow electricity undertaking that happened in the 1930s, electricity came to the street, that big changes can happen within, you know, infrastructure projects fast if there's political will and kind of making a case for this to happen again. And I've just put that book in Ashley Dawson's People, People's Power really has become our kind of, again, another key text that informs this kind of consolidating the realization that monopolies of energy and power should be challenged. And so we're building this slowly. It's been growing over the year, talking to loads of people kind of working out a structure for the project. And a key challenge with lots of these projects is that there's so much work behind the scenes and so little um, kind of support for doing that, that actually with bank job, we realized that lots of communities wanted to do the same and take action in the same way as us, but we didn't have a way of sharing that in a ease kind of a template. Whereas we're building that into this project by um, opening up a power membership site. So people join, it fuels the making of this project whilst also sharing the knowledge and distributing that to other communities as we go. And that kind of comes from kind of going door to door, going step by step around the street, just asking who who's up for it. <laughs> and plenty of people are and plenty of people aren't. And really, although on one level, this is hyper local, like literally building power and connections on the doorstep, like one doorstep at a time. It's not really about the local or the individual action you can take, but about the way we use the project as a rallying cry and a call to action and a demand. And it's a kind of show and do project. Power Station is show and do project and trigger for people to recognize that, that we all have power to make a difference. So tomorrow, literally, we're, we're re, kind of reissuing a new currency or issuing a new currency. This time they're called the Greenbacks. And these banknotes will again be printed in the local area by local people. But the promise on these Greenbacks, inspired by the original Greenback, the dollars that were printed to go to war, so to avoid to borrow from um, private banks in the American Civil War. That was kind of the origin of the dollar. These greenbacks have the promise that 50% of their exchange to sterling will help build the infrastructure for a power station, and 50% will build community wealth in what we're seeing as a kind of grassroots Green New Deal now, so that everyone supporting the project becomes a greenbacker. And all the people on the notes, rather than one figurehead this time, we have a kind of collective of people. So this is really like people power in print. And the notes from five to a thousand feature school, uh, grassroots football team, um, uh, energy efficiency charity, who are they? The, a food growing co-op, a youth project, migrant action network, and who are they? Uh, a homeless kitchen. And so they're really an ecosystem of local organizations, either kind of building new models of economies like the food growing co-op or quite literally firefighting the uh, economic system that's you know not working and rising poverty levels. So this is a, I suppose this is a nice chance as we go into production in May to kind of invite everyone to come and kind of work with us on this project. It's not really about one- Minutes or one community it's about kind of how to do to solve these interrelated crises that we work together and we're bringing in solar for schools and hopefully repowering London to help us expand the power station beyond here and we also need all the help we can get on the next phase of insulation on a whole street um, level so I suppose the power project is essentially about transforming infrastructure really inspired by a solar punk idea of um infrastructure as resistance and power. And it's not really just about the infrastructures of our built environments, but of our lives and imaginations and the ability to kind of take power and, Im and imagine and make kind of a better system that goes behind the scenes of fossil capitalism and the kind of structures of enchantment and feelings that keep us all in that way of seeing and believing that things can't change. And so, I kind of wanted to end on some links there if you want to catch up on it, but also some provocations about these kind of projects where how do you win trust with communities, public and risk averse authorities in the case of these kind of rebel projects? How do you sustain public engagement 
kind of retaining that rebellious spirit in the face of exhaustion and inaction? And how kind of critically do you frame the story to make it contagious and irresistible and to reverse the narratives of loss to ones of mischief and joy and power? So I hope to discuss some of those with you soon. <laughs> Thank you. Wow, that is amazing. I have a different um, feeling linked to the word power now altogether. Um, I'll uh, actually hand over to Susan, however, uh, holding on to that feeling of power. I will hold, hand over to Susan to um, give us um, her start of a 10 in, in her communication strategy. Hi, everybody. Uh, as I was introduced before, I'm a writer, workshop leader, and a conceptual illustrator from Carlisle. Trained in theatre design, specialised in costume, and I've also trained in early years education and playwork with Forest School Provision, one of the focus modules. Being a wild swimmer and a fell walker gives me great inspiration. The environment is reflected in my poetry and in my workshops. Um, I've been published by various um, publications around Cumbria as well as nationally and in various anthologies and been the writer in residence, as was mentioned, for Cumbria Wildlife Trust Gosling site since 2020. I was initially asked to advise on how to explore more engaging ways to communicate the climate crisis with clients, colleagues and collaborators. How do I engage with the public? How would I get a message across? My initial thoughts on public engagement of this sort include don't hot sell anything as environmental, as this is still seen as niche to some people. Make any proposals seem genuine, normal and organised. People will and do switch off if there's too much information or jargon. I'm quite guilty of it myself. Have the information ready for questions, but the first impression should be practical and engaging. The three word slogan makes me cringe, but it is an effective starting point for workshopping. A project I worked on, which was um, a diverse Cumbria shortlist finalist project was Mind Trees of the Urban Forest. It was a community project which I constructed and curated. A community installation incorporating exhibition, film and anthology with a spoken word session and music performance. I had a vision for what I wanted to achieve with the project and initial thoughts of who I wanted to work with, which groups or individuals, which styles I wanted to capture to enhance the ideas that I already had. Once I had my vision, it was easier to know how to proceed. Knowing who I wanted to include made it easier for me to know how to include them. Being clear about what you want to achieve is half the battle. Bullet points, storyboards or PowerPoints may help you communicate clearer than lengthy text or fantastic PowerPoint we've just seen with great visual images, it brings across the message to people who you couldn't view the, the exhibition, but we got exactly what flavor it was from, from those visuals. I've recently been involved with, a, with religious education provision in schools and we were all asked to provide a video clip of our view on faith uh, or lack of faith. Um, and this is an easy, easily accessible medium for the, the digital age students. And it forms a bank of vox pops that can be accessed in classes or at home. If you're designing something, neatly labeled diagrams will always benefit the manufacturer. I learned this in theater costume. It's wasteful to make up your mind after the realization and will annoy and alienate people. So clear communication is always imperative. Engaging with others to help realize your vision voluntarily requires excitement and belief in your own ideas. If you aren't enthusiastic, why should anybody else be? The drive to ignite passion must come from within. And even if you're not good at talking to people, 
or maybe you don't like people. You need to inspire cooperation. And so the inspiration has to start with you. The Mind Trees project had at its heart a theme that was common to everyone, that of mental health, good or bad. Finding a common purpose or interest is often key to community engagement. If there's no hook, it will not grab people's attention. If an idea is lukewarm, it will not heat their passion. Once people are hooked, they will want to know more. And that is when you bombard them with the facts, information and jargon. But the hook has to be present to start with. The reason I'm saying this is because all too often people can be turned away from involvement because there's too much explanation. There's too much telling and not enough showing. People want to feel they have something to offer to put part of themselves into a project they're involved with. If there's no room for their own selves other than grunt work, it can become a turnoff. If you're involving the community, it has to be involvement. If you're seeking to champion your own work, you cannot claim it is a community project. All you then require is staff. With this in mind, don't let good be the enemy of perfect. Keep the project on track, but recognise that volunteers will do the task to the best of their ability. In Mind Trees, I knew what elements I wanted, but I had to allow a little freedom with the pieces that people created. The anthology and the exhibition had a structure that I had decided, but the actual responses were individual. Communicating the vision allowed people to engage but to bring their own input and their own interpretation. I understand that architectural projects might be different in that respect, but there's always room to listen to people's concerns or ideas. I was asked to attend an architectural retreat in Buttermere Youth Hostel to offer my opinion about requirements for a shelter for open water swimmers. This was very interesting. There were four of us, two teams of two. My team wanted a very understated, non-intrusive structure. The other team had much more loftier ideas. I got the impression that the architecture students preferred the other team to mine as it gave them the opportunity to justify their designs rather than actually listening to what my team was saying with regard to blending into the environment using local, local sustainable materials and keeping the swim wild. When asking people's advice, who will be using the thing, living in the thing or looking at the thing, it's important to acknowledge that advice. The hard sell of hard truths was my job that day as I had to point out that what they were showing me was not what we had actually said we wanted. So listening is a good thing. The project I worked on, Poetry for a Purpose, came about because I'd noticed a recurring theme in the poetry many of us were performing at open mic sessions, that of climate change and environmental concerns. Earth Day that year was being hosted by a Carlisle head teacher, and I thought it would be a useful platform to showcase Cumbrian environmental writing, and especially to include writing from young people. This showed people that their concerns were being heard and shared it made people feel part of something and using their talents to draw attention to something. It made people feel valued and listened to. Taking workshops into schools with the aim then of linking to Earth Day is often the long and sneaky game. Children are very receptive to injustices and will do the job of berating parents for you. Woe betide any parent who doesn't recycle after lessons have happened in school. Children enjoy being given permission and asked their reaction because they do not get to make too many decisions about their own schedule. The environment is a subject school aged children can and do get very determined and emotional about. So harness this drive. Working with the Wordsworth Trust has seen me deliver specific workshops for people who tell me they are not writers. The key here 
is to make it easy for them to see they are capable of producing pieces by recognizing their fears and sidestepping potential pitfalls. Word games, easy poetry forms, and working alongside other crafts removes some of that fear. Going outside and having prompts based on specific venues removes the blank page people may fear about writing poetry. Working with mental health service users at Cumbria Wildlife Trust has been exhausting but rewarding. Again, assessing potential obstacles such as fear, jargon, different ways of processing information and communication means that the sessions can be adaptable and adapted and rewarding for the clients as well as the practitioner. Using paper craft, group work and emotional stimulus can be engaging for clients, not necessarily verbally responsive. Two minutes. Oh, I'm finishing up. Connecting with people needs connection, being grateful for input, being positive, even if this means some compromise. People don't respond well to negativity. And if you've communicated your desire clearly, public responses should be appropriate. If they are not, have you made the right connection? Creativity is part of people's soul, just as it is yours. If you allow yourself to be vulnerable, it will help you connect with others. Honesty of emo emotional thought processes opens people up. And smile, it always goes a long way. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was so powerful. Um, I can already feel there's a theme between all four speakers coming through. There's so much connection with everything they are saying about being vulnerable, open, leaving a hook, which Marin actually did in the action, um, to try and engage people, leaving a space for involvement, making people take action, speak the same language and listening, which um, Esther um, started off with and Susan finished off with, <laughs> is talking very much the same language. And it's also very linked to climate emergency as well. Everything they talk about from wildlife from you know um sea level rises in, in the story and um the uh, crisis you know whether it's capitalism and, and energy is all kind of all linked to our climate emergency um and our health um which um Esther was talking about these are all kind of interlinked together um and so powerfully put across um I'll now have to give you a very difficult task of um, choosing breakout rooms that you want to be in. The main room. As people are joining us back again. I hope you enjoyed your sessions. Um, I'm, uh, I have been, I have um, actually was uh, moved to tears in Merrin's. Um, and I'm sure all the others are equally powerful and amazing. Um, I would like to invite each um, room to report back what you have been doing. And um, if I can invite Esther's group to uh, be spotlighted and come forward and tell us what you've been doing. Thank you. Um, we had a very interesting discussion. We learned from each other, which was amazing. And Scott was taking the notes. So I'll invite Scott to share what he has and other people can also chime in. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, ours was, oh, it was fantastic. It was real kind of active listening and building upon what came before it. So really just began with how are we listening to people and kind of identifying what is important to them instead of kind of imposing and printing much more coming from the how can I be of service than I would love to do this. And then talking about kind of how we're communicating and learning from it's great to learn from the international context, but it's also really important for people to know there's a local link so making that link between international learnings and conversations and how they're applied locally. And then we had a scenario presented to us that was tying kind of different things, tying a scenario from uh, linking between 
a conversation that Ezra had, had around her own work around the link between childhood trauma and the built environment and getting kind of allowing people space to step back because for a lot of people climate change is not something that is the immediate most pressing issue there's something else happening in their lives and also recognizing as something that as architects in particular we really need to learn is knowing when to step back and to recognize and to say and be very honest saying I am not an expert in this but being ready to learn if you're invited to learn and that was incredibly powerful as well kind of an empathizing with people and being able to acknowledge when when you don't have the answer and you want to learn from them because that can come from all different directions and did I miss anything Esther or was that I think I, tr I pulled it together quite tight <laughs> You did an excellent job. So I think tying the loop back to climate change that I challenged the group to think about the question childhood trauma and the built environment because it was posed to me. But then I said that because of the two way learning that ended up happening, the community members are the ones who taught me how to make the connection and they told me that a lot of these children are living in congested spaces and anything extra that happens, whether it's extreme heat of flooding that results in displacements or dark alleys that, are, uh, that result in crime, the incident of crime going up, anything else that happens exacerbates the situation. So they're the ones who actually empowered me by telling me, well, <laughs> if you're ready to listen, we can tell you how to engage and we can help you to understand how to connect the extreme weather related stressors, flooding, heating to the issues that are top of our priority. Thank you, Scott. Oh, that was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Um, yes, it's active listening that um, kind of prompts all the opportunities, isn't it? Um, we will then have Marin and Gina. Um, if Gina would like to um, tell us about the session. Yes, um, I don't really want to spoil the story because I've just seen that Marin will share it with us um, afterwards. So I'll let everyone watch that um, because the way she told it, as Glow said, was very moving. Um, the whole idea following the story is that we made our own little boats. Oh, we can't really see because of the background. Um, and the idea is that you make these boats and something physical that you make in the workshop um, and close hold, holding hers up to um, allows you to kind of connect a bit more and to have something physical to take away. And then you can take this boat home and put a picture of your loved one inside it. And then when you look at this boat, and you think, well, you look at this boat when you make a choice or have to make a choice between something that would affect the climate and whether that choice would directly affect your loved one, whether that's a child, grandchild, um, inside this boat, where, would it make them sink? Would it make them float away? Would it make them be turned away from their destination? Um, and that connection of having a loved one or someone that you recognise or someone that you is hold dear to you makes the decisions a bit more personable a bit more it, you're not as disconnected because there's a lot of decisions with climate change and um things like that that we make that are so dis disconnected from ourselves because we don't see them firsthand whereas if you imagine your friend family member directly affected um it can really bring it home Yes, yeah, very powerful message, and um, the the actions made it even more so. And we've all got a memento to to bring home with, um, which is oh, we're home, I suppose, but <laughs> to to keep um, was very very good. And I think acting out all the things that um, uh, all the other speakers were talking about, um, sort of the power, action, and hope, and um, thinking listening you know all of that was embodied in one storytelling which was very very amazing um we have the second uh, third group sorry hillary and victoria hey yeah, yeah we had um a great conversation um and we were joined by hillary's partner dan um and there's some some fantastic questions from from people so um one was about sort of uh, talking about collaboration and, and working alongside people and, and the asylum seekers that, that Hillary has um, uh, sort of brought in and um, to work with. 
um, and making a conscious effort um, for, to, to encourage the diversity of participants. I think that sort of seemed to be quite important. Um, and making it, um, you know, sort of learning together and building a team. I think that came across really strongly about how it was, it was about a team and this, this sort of, uh, I think Hillary said something about the, the, the bank heist terminology, <laughs> building a team. Um, and then there was a, a question about resourcing um, and obviously how it can be a struggle on a, a small budget, but how um, you found uh, the funds through sort of small, small pots, uh, memberships, obviously printing of, of the money and then selling of the artworks. Um, and, and also then talking about how, uh, you know, sort of get, going back to this teamwork about how um, everyone is able to, to participate in, in making some of the participation very shareable. Um, there was something about uh, renting and um, one of the issues was that um, even the, the landlords, that they were being offered free solar panels for the, for the renters, but they weren't taking it up and how to get landlords engaged and in, in trying to um, uh, sort of looking at finding common ground, coming back to this, you know, common ground and, and working together, um, trying to find sort of solutions to, to, to the pain that people might be feeling and, and these sort of struggles um, and trying to tie it together. Um, and uh, again, about the asylum seekers, about um, you know, sort of giving everyone an opportunity to, to be involved, but making it paid as well, not, not just volunteers. And then finally, Hillary, um, I think you're going to have to put the link in, in the um, chat because I can't remember it, but there is a competition. Yeah. Uh, artwork. <laughs> I can't, re uh, sorry, Hillary, I couldn't remember off the top of my head. But uh, you have a chance to win some of the artwork that Hillary is producing if you, if you join in the, the competition. Wow, that sounds amazing. And um, what a diverse conversation you had. Um, oh, we talked about everything. <laughs> there was a lot. I know. And yeah, just really relevant with all the refugees, with, you know, what was happening with Ukraine and, you know, the resource grabbing, even just resourcing your own project, you know, in this world where we're all snatching resources, you know, and, and you know, it's all an effect of climate change and, you know, um, a population and, and refugees from everywhere, um, whether we turn them away on, on the boats <laughs> um, and or not, or, or we help them um, and how we do that. Um, it's all, all very connected and um, amazing. Um, thank you for sharing. If we move on to Susan and Stephanie. Shall I start Susan and then you can fill in um where all of the, the things I'm gonna miss. <laughs> so we had a very international group uh, in our room. Um, we had Tracy, um, who was based in California, um, who's head pop NGO called Super, um, which is eliminating single use plastic. Um, we had Alexandra from Vancouver, who's working in um, urban design and planning and, and implementing uh, the sustainability action plan uh, as part of, kind of policy. Um, we have Rachel, who's an architect, um, and was really keen in uh, talking about kind of communicating and getting people excited about uh, talking about the climate crisis and what we can, the solutions we've got. Um, we have Mark, who worked uh, part time with AD, so and then also was freelance uh, with us artists. Um, and wanted to communicate and engage imagination and empathy. And really, um, we were talking about how uh, the act of listening is really important. Uh, Martin uh, was self-employed and again kind of topics of communication and how we can do that most effectively uh, we spoke about and Terry who's a wood scientist uh, works with wood knowledge in Wales but also a lot with architects um, really enjoys writing we spoke about um, kind of how you can enjoy that writing and try and get it from something that's quite personal to something that you can share with people um, so the main points we spoke about were uh, engaging people to have a voice and if people produce something, there's often common ground that's found. Um, so building communities is really important and kind of from kind of underlying anxiety to kind of much more deeply ingrained uh, kind of worrying feelings people have. When you talk about it, it makes people feel safe. And we, when we talk about the environment, how do we make people see its urgency and want to change that? 
So you'll vote on a triangle, um, the, the one thing you want to see more of in the conversations about um, kind of climate change. And we held this triangle up to create this bunting of hope. And I think Rachel might share a pitch around in the chat if anyone's interested <laughs> in seeing what that looked like. But it was just sort of flipping the narrative and thinking about things in a slightly different way. Um, so the conversation that followed the bunting of hope was presenting your own ideas as the first choice. Um, and so the alternative kind of is the main challenge to the status quo. And then as part of that as well, you know, bringing in the conversation, recognizing where people feel afraid of your, of your um, alternative and yeah, using that to create a really constructive conversation and thinking about other people's perspectives first and also thinking about that in the long term as well. So we spoke about children and how annoying children can be in their naggingness, but how we can really utilize this as the tool um, and the kind of harness that enjoyment about learning on the environment and kind of the curiosity that kids have and what we can bring to the kind of climate conversation in that sense. And then we finally ended on a really interesting point about um, the kind of eco anxiety that comes from the scale and the urgency of the challenge and the systemic and overwhelming uh, issues that we all kind of struggle with on an individual level and how do we bring people into that conversation and then we sort of touched on imagination being really really important. Anything to add Susan? Yeah it's just I noticed in one of the chat comments again that somebody said how, how to not terrify teenagers or not not depress them um, but allow them to have a voice is is the bottom line, really. Allow them to express their worries in whatever creative way or non-creative way, verbal, non-verbal way. You know, if people have worries, it's because they want something to, to change, to happen. And so getting it all out, you know, everyone says it's a good cry or a good laugh or a good talk. It's really important. So, yeah, recognise that teenagers and children and adults have worries but get it out there in a creative way, however it, however you express yourself, because only by sharing it will we all realise that, yeah, we all feel a bit like this, so what can we do about it? And it starts starts the, the conversational and hopefully practical ball rolling. Thank you so much. And that's very helpful for um, answering questions in the chat. Um, if there are any other um, questions for our speakers, please do um, put it into the chat um, and we'll try and get the speakers to um, answer them. Um, so I should have said that at the beginning of the feedback, um, but if you can think of any, please do um, put them there now. Um, there was um, a point about, um, oh gosh, lost it now. Um, oh yeah, somebody, posted the uh, ragged trousered philanthropist um was that hillary's um posting would someone like to expand on that the ragged trousered philanthropists preface this is a librivox all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information, in columns of the Daily Obscurer. No luck, replied Bundy gloomily. I had a bob each way on Stockwell in the first. Sorry. <laughs> you wait. wait, sorry, I was just looking at the link. Uh, is that related to... Um... Sorry, it's Mac here. I, I actually posted that because one of the speakers was talking about um, utilities, electricity or gas supplies, and there's something within the ragged trousered philanthropist that I thought was actually quite relevant to the comments you made earlier. Oh, great. Thanks. You've not read the book. Thank you. I haven't. So I'll, I'll look at that. So are there... Um, are there any more uh, questions for our speakers or any points you want clarified or any questions for um, workshops that you didn't join that would, you would like to ask? Oh, question for Hilary about power. What has it been like going door to door with a project and talking about it on the doorstep? Oh, uh, am I unmuted? Yeah. Um, yep. Pretty yeah. terrifying, to be honest. I mean, I've worked for 
all the time with communities and participation, but because it is on our street, it, at times it is it is hard because you're going from door to door and in but and then you know and it is quite amazing now that every everyone that we well we've probably we've got a chart behind can you see of the street and it's color coded to say like who we've talked to who've said yes to solar who who um ha will agree to be filmed because you know that's kind of we want to share this whole process and make and make a film and who has put up a poster so it is quite encouraging now that there's so many there is like this power station posters in uh, maybe two thirds or maybe a bit less of of the windows now but that process yeah of not taking it personally when people say no thank you because I'm just what you know I'm not that kind of very diplomatic really because you're like but it's so the urgency is so much why are you saying no to this <laughs> but you can't you can't say that and I've never been a, a kind of door knocker so that's been a challenge Dan's been doing that more but as we've grown the project then we've got more of a group of us so it's not just us anymore it's like a little team a street team that can go out on a Saturday and, and do it and just keeping going and actually I think everyone's scared of it and but actually when once it's done although actually not everyone there's someone on the street who we really miss she went to Australia for a while and we're like please come back because she actually loves knocking on doors we're like how do you love it but um yeah so there was a real stepping outside of the comfort zone to do that and the fact that we live here that whenever we're we're, we're just going to bed and you can hear people on the street going what's this power station then oh and, you know and they might say something quite insulting and you're like um I can hear you because I'm in the house so it has been a massive it, it is it's quite tough I think is because it is our home place because we can't escape and go to, oh well that's our a nice you know site that we're working with somewhere else it, it's our community and home and I like yeah. the word habitat but, but it's beautiful <laughs> as well like it's it's really extreme knocking on doors because it's like you do get like the person literally on the other side of the wall slam the door on on me but then you get these such beautiful experiences as well where you meet these people that you had no idea that they were there and they're just extraordinary people you know so um so it's, it's it is really rewarding uh but it's also one of those you just have to like doing these types of projects you basically just have to become like one with living really far outside of your comfort zone effectively every day is just another another day in the breeze isn't it <laughs> but I think maybe maybe because we're filming as well and then the more you habituate people to like your our presence with the film cameras with you know it must be very annoying for some people to always have their neighbors out and about with a camera but you know I'm filming the squirrels and the pigeons and the changing seasons and it's just like people go all right there you are again then you know it's <laughs> just like so you just become part of the street furniture after a while I hopefully in some ways that's great that's great yeah and and know your um neighbors really really well <laughs> by the yeah. end <laughs> um there's a question from seb ask, asking possibly marin might know the answer to um but any speakers are, are able to answer if they want to direct us to other examples or resources of great climate storytelling yeah that's a really good question actually um I, I, before the event, I was just Googling it. Um, so I, what I, I have been more in touch with is just resources around storytelling. And because I also came from a teaching background um, and a drama theatre background. So all kinds of different ways in which um, we tell stories just that people engage with and listen to and don't switch off from. So I... I don't have specific resources around telling climate stories, but I think in a sense, it, it doesn't really matter what story you want to tell, the, the same principles apply um, about about drawing people in, about engaging people. Um, and, and those are things like it, it being personal, um, it, being, it being specific rather than generalized. The more you can cite a story, in you know i mean and like esther did it naturally right at the start of of the evening by just telling us about you know we all have that image of that taxi driver and hitting himself and um to to get rid of these mosquitoes so the more a story is is, is specific is personal um it, it is sort of um sensory in that way actually draws people in to what it feels like to be there physically in that experience um, those are all just, just some of the principles off the top of my head. But 
yeah, there, there are some great books out there. So again, I'll try and um, get a hold of some of those links and pass them on to, to Glow, just in general about telling stories for change making. Yeah, I think uh, um, I'll try and collect any um, um, speaker info stuff and then we'll get a sort of like um, party bag or whatever you call it uh, to send to all the participants um, afterwards. I think Susan also have a, um, a response in the chat about kids books out there. Um, and Hillary also had a hand up. We go to Susan just now and then go back to loop back round. Oh, yeah, it's just this because my husband's a teacher and he's constantly getting books or rushing through the, the boys bookcases and taking all the, the decent books. There's loads of resources and, and I keep saying about um, talking to children about it. You know, they, they, they are the ones who will take the message forward. They're the ones who we should be normalizing what you're talking about. This should be their normal vocabulary. Um, we talked we talked earlier about um, making the, the language every day, you know, like, and, and I said at the start, some people still see environmental concerns as a bit niche, a bit not, not for them. And by just making the language every day, um, it, it will be, children's normal it will be what children expect to have you know why should we not be recycling or even why should we not be making um things that the plastics that break down that kind of that should be what they should expect to see on the shelves that kind of thing and if it's not that why not you know the the, the old way should be the weird ways the the kind of sustainable way should be that's what we do anyway kind of thing so yeah. um I keep saying, get them young, get them young. They're, they're the ones that will take the message forward. Hilary, you had a point. Oh, it was just another resource, but more from film storytelling. We, we, one of our funders for Bank Job is Doc, Doc Society. Um, and they, if you go to their, I can give a link, but they have specifically focused in on the Climate Story Lab, which is international filmmakers and short films, but their resources are really good generally there are resources for filmmakers but actually it would apply to all storytelling these kind of ideas of drafting your um artistic vision but also your impact vision like what you want to achieve from your story or your project so that's a that was a good link but also just that going to the children thing our, our daughter's 11 and this eco anxiety is really intense and yeah finding as someone mentioned in the chat the, the positive outcome stories and positive news because I remembered when I was probably her age, it was the hole in the ozone layer that was keep giving me nightmares. And you're like, oh, wow, yeah, that was a, you know, we, you know, thing action happened on that. And she's like, really? And, you know, to tell, yeah, to find ways of showing that we can actually alter some of the courses of action that are happening. Because otherwise, yeah, this despair is prevalent. Yeah. I think that that kind of despair is very different for for the people who are actually on poverty line. I think um, um, I didn't go to Esther's workshop, but um, speaking to her before tonight, Esther was telling me about how people really in poverty, they, they actually care more about where the food comes from. They have a lot of anxiety, but from different things, and they don't even know to relate it to climate change. It is because of climate change, but it's sort of the link. Um, um that they haven't even sort of made that jump that they're worrying and then anxious about having no food the no food is caused by climate change but then you know their day-to-day -day survival is the anxiety rather than the ozone hole that you can't see so since glow mentioned my name can i just say something quickly? yeah sure yeah, yeah. so in connection with that so that was another uncomfortable situation that i ended up in where i showed up to talk about a bio brick a more sustainable brick and then i realized that the people i was dealing with their most immediate need was food security and that several years or several months later on because i stopped talking about the bricks and just started listening to them and trying to learn as much as possible I realized that some of the interventions that have been proposed by the built environment professionals have actually hurt them more. So I use an example of Kibera slums in Nairobi, that somebody comes with this brilliant idea, let us relocate you to a place where the land is more affordable, therefore you'll have more space. 
But guess what? We visited examples of such communities in Kenya, Tanzania, and Mexico two hours into the trip by private means, you're still moving. And when we finally ended up where the people, where they are the targeted location, it was in the middle of nowhere in terms of the, there are no jobs, the land is not arable. So even though the built environment doesn't really look, it doesn't appear to be a, a, a connection to food security and climate change in that regard, it actually is <laughs> that if we are relocating people to places that where the impact of climate change is making it impossible for them to sustain themselves by cultivating food ETC, we are hurting them. So as part of our interventions, we are now starting to think about, you know, why are we proposing that this relocation be done to? And uh, what is the access? How, how easy is it going to be for them to get access to food, energy, water? And if climate is changing, we cannot just design for today. We need to be thinking about what's going to happen five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, that's really good insight for you know working directly in the grassroots for people who um, literally have nothing. Um, what an insight. Um, I'd like to draw our evening to a close, as that might be very, very sad to do so, um, but it is um, time that we end. And um, just want to remind you of the upcoming um, two events. That is a, uh, the continuation of this series and um, the AD Masterclass series um, in tandem with each other and hope that you'll be able to join some of it with us um, and that we'll see you again soon.